to open your Bible with me in 1 Kings chapter 10. 1 Kings chapter 10. First Kings chapter 10 and verse 1, it's telling us the story of the Queen of Sheba. And when the Queen of Sheba heard the fame of Solomon concerning the name of the Lord, she came to prove him with hard questions. And she came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bear spices, and very much gold and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, he com she communed with him of all that was in her heart. And Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hid from the king which he told her not. And the queen of Sheba, uh, sorry, and when the queen of Sheba had seen all Solomon's wisdom and the house that he had built and the meat of this table and the sitting of his servants and the attendance of his ministers and their apparel and his cupbearers and his ascent by which he went up to the house of the Lord, there was no more spirit in her. And she said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of thy acts and of thy wisdom. Howbeit, I believed not the words until I came, and mine eyes had seen it, and behold, the half was not told me. Thy wisdom and prosperity exceedeth the fame which I heard. Happy are thy men, happy are these thy servants, would stand continually before thee and hear thy wisdom. And then I'd like you to turn in your Bible, please, to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. And I'd like you to remain with that portion of Scripture open. I think that you've noted from uh, Friday until now, the media has been... Uh, wall-to-wall -wall coverage of the death of Muhammad Ali. Uh, they acclaim, or rather he acclaimed, that he was the greatest. I don't think modesty was a virtue with Muhammad Ali. My favorite story of him is when he was on an aeroplane and having spoken to all the passengers ar around him when it was time for the plane to take off, the air hostess asked everyone to sit and he sat down to buckle up, but he didn't buckle up his seat back. Uh, Seatbelt, and uh, the air hostess said to him, Mr. Uh, Muhammad Ali, would you buckle up? He said, Madam, Superman need no belt. She said, Sir, Superman need no aeroplane. Buckle up. And he, he had to do that. I say wall-to-wall -wall coverage, claiming that he is the greatest of them all, of course, as a fighter and perhaps as a personality. He eclipsed so many others. Uh, but the story of Muhammad Ali reminds me of a story that comes out of archaeology. Archaeologists were doing a dig in Egypt in the sandy terrain, and they came on a plinth. And when they deciphered the hieroglyphics, they found that the plinth just simply said, I am the greatest of them all. They couldn't find whoever the figure was, and it took them some time until finally they came upon a statue a statue to this person who acclaimed that he had been the greatest of them all. But archaeology teaches us that the sands of time have a way of wiping out the opinions of men and take away the greatness of those who have gone before. And so it is with Muhammad Ali, for he, like all other men, has got feet of clay. I say that as a, an introduction to reading here in Matthew chapter 12, because this chapter introduces us to the greatness of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. I say that this evening because when it comes to greatness, he stands alone. He is unique, solitary. There is no one who can compare with him. He is the incomparable Lord Jesus Christ. Lord of lords, as we heard this morning, King of kings, and he shall reign forever and ever. Listen to what it says, and I just pick out these verses in Matthew chapter 12. The Lord Jesus is amidst these uh, Sadducees and Pharisees. They are jaundiced against him with their prejudice. They are so blind that they cannot see who he is. 
and therefore they follow him to criticize him and to scandalize him. And our Lord Jesus, in this occasion, as you look at verse 6, the Lord Jesus says unto them as he speaks of the temple, But I say unto you that in this place is one greater than the temple. Think of that this evening. The temple of Solomon was the most magnificent building that had ever been made. And not only because of the grandeur of the building, but the function for which it was made. It was the meeting place with God. It was at the temple where God came down and met with man. And yet though I remind you that the Bible tells us that in Christ there is one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus, who gave his life a ransom for many. We do not meet with God necessarily in buildings made with hands that are decorated with gold and silver, as was the temple. But rather, the Bible tells us, we meet with God in the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And he himself says here that as a priest, he is greater than the temple, greater than the altar, greater than the sacrifice. He is the great high priest over the house of God. And says he, in the presence of those Sadducees, there is one here who is greater than the temple. Matthew chapter 12 and verse 41. He's speaking still with the same congregation of those who would criticize and accuse him. And in verse 40, rather, he says this word, For as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. The men of Nineveh shall rise in judgment with this generation and shall condemn it because they repented at the preaching of Jonah. And behold, a greater than Jonah is here. Think of how that must have cut into the hearts of those religionists of that particular time. Why, Jews to this day, they revere the name of Jonah when it comes to Passover week. Why, Jews are required throughout that week to read the short prophecy of Jonah because outside of John the Baptist and Moses, he was considered to be the greatest of all of the prophets. And here is our Lord Jesus saying that amongst you stands one who is not only greater than the temple in all of its glory, but greater than the prophets in all of his authority. Think of that. You see, it is Jonah who preached and prophesied and to his word why Nineveh repented and many turned to God. But in our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, he not only brings the Word, he is the eternal Word. In the beginning was the Word, says the Bible, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. By him all things were made. This is our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. He not only brings the Word of God, he is the Word of God. He is the revelation of God because he is God himself, and he is far greater than Jonah greater than the temple, greater than Jonah. And so our Lord Jesus continues, and he says this word in verse 42, referring to the queen of Sheba. The queen of the south shall rise up in the judgment with this generation and shall condemn it. For she came from the uttermost parts of the earth to hear the wisdom of Solomon. And behold, a greater than Solomon is here. Greater, I say, than all the splendor of the, of the temple. Greater than all the authority of the prophet. But here, our Lord Jesus said that he is greater in all of the grandeur of Solomon, the wisest, the wealthiest king who ever lived. And he said that he was greater. Can you imagine these Pharisees, these religionists, who esteemed Solomon as the greatest king who ever lived, saying within themselves, who does he think he is? Solomon was the son of a king. He's the son of a carpenter. Eh? Can't you see them looking and saying, Solomon, Solomon was born in a palace. He was born in a stable. Solomon was born in Jerusalem, but this this man was born in the back end of Bethlehem, a village on the outskirts of the city. Solomon had many servants to wait upon him. 
but Jesus has no servants who wait upon him. Solomon was, was robed in kingly regalia, but Jesus wears a peasant's garb. Solomon, Solomon drank from vessels of gold, but Jesus had to accept the drink from a harlot at a well in Samaria. Solomon was rich beyond compare, but this man, by his own admission, he is not anywhere to lay his head. Solomon had armies that obeyed his command, but he's got a bunch of fishermen who follow after him. Solomon had great mansions, but Jesus was homeless. He had, Solomon had horses and chariots, but, but this man walked everywhere. Who does he think he is? Greater than Solomon? Greater than the temple? Greater than Jonah? Greater than Solomon? And yet, my friend, on this time when we hear that someone is acclaimed the greatest of them all, may I still remind you, Jesus Christ stands unique. He is the greatest. And why should we say that this evening? Why, we've been reading of the Queen of Sheba when she came to Solomon. First of all, the Bible tells us that when she came, she was overwhelmed with the wisdom of Solomon. As a matter of fact, she came with all of her questions, questions in her heart. And the Bible tells us there that she told them all to Solomon. There was not anything hid from the king, but he told her all. She was impressed with the wisdom of Solomon. It is true that he was a wise man. If you were to read 1 Kings chapter 4, you will read there that Solomon, he wrote, he wrote 3,000 Proverbs. We've got the book of Proverbs. We have the, the book of Ecclesiastes. We have the Song of Solomon. He was a great intelligent man. 3,000 Proverbs. Not only so, he had memorized something like 1,005 Proverbs songs. He wrote them all. Isn't that amazing? An author, a composer, the, the counselor, the one who was able to answer all of the questions and get to the bottom of all of the problems of the Queen of Sheba. It, it, would it be true to say that Jesus is greater than that? First Kings chapter 4 tells us that he also knew all of the fish and all of the birds of the air and all of the animals. He knew all about ethology. He knew all about zoology. My friend, he had all of the ologies up to here. He was the wisest, most learned man of his day. And yet to say that Jesus is greater, my friend, can I say that Solomon was wise because he studied the great creation of God. But Jesus is wiser because he is the one who created the very creation that Solomon studied. He is the one, my friend, who put the stars into space. The Bible says without him there was not anything made that was made. We're living in a world today, my friend, that whether we look through a microscope or we look through the telescope into the vastness of our universe, every part of it is stamped with a mark of intelligent design indicating to us that there is a great creator. And therefore, behind that creator, there was a creation, or behind that creation, there was a creator, one who was infinitely wiser than Solomon. As a matter of fact, when the Queen of Sheba came with all of her questions, the Bible tells us that Solomon had the answer to everyone. Does this Bible not remind us that our blessed Lord Jesus is the wonderful counselor? Thank God he's got the answer to the problems of every heart. As a matter of fact, as I speak to you this evening, and we look across our world that is filled with problems, let's remember this, that the greatest problem of all is the problem of the heart. It's out of the heart, says the Bible, that all problems flow. It's out of the heart, said Jesus Christ, that comes murder and hate and and thieving and, and uh, covetousness. It's out of the heart. The Bible says that out of the heart come the issues of life. And yet our blessed Lord Jesus Christ, thank God, he is the one who addresses the problems of the human heart. And he is the one, my friend, who can forgive our sin and wash us clean in the, his precious blood. He can give to us a brand new heart. He gives to us what the Bible says, he will make us a brand new creature. 
He will cause us to be born again, have a brand new start in life. Why? Because he is a mighty counselor. As a matter of fact, when we think of Solomon, Solomon was intelligent in that he studied all of God's creation. He knew all about the cycles of the wind. He knew all about the movement of the sea. But may I just remind you, while he knew about the wind and knew about the sea, the wind knew Christ, the sea obeyed his voice. One day, our blessed Lord, while he was asleep, the disciples wakened him. A great storm had arisen. And the Bible tells us in Mark chapter 4 that they awakened Jesus and he stood up and he rebuked the wind and he spoke to the waves and he spoke to the sea and there was a great calm. And the Bible tells us the disciples were amazed and said one to another, what manner of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Solomon knew about the wind and the sea. But my friend, the wind and the sea knew the voice of the mighty Creator. It is true that Solomon knew all about the navigations of the ships that came to the ports of Israel. But our blessed Lord Jesus not only knew about the navigation, why Jesus walked on the waters. The waters obeyed his voice. One day in Cana of Galilee, he spoke to the water that was put into the, the jars. And the Bible tells us that when he spoke, the water blushed itself into wine. Why? Because the water recognized the voice of its mighty creator. He is wiser than Solomon. As a matter of fact, when we read the book of Solomon, Solomon said of his life that for all of his wisdom, he had missed it in life. For him, all was vanity. He had tried luxury and liquor. He had, he had tried, my friend, all the sins that men would indulge in. And yet he said his life was empty. It was like chasing after the wind. He hadn't got it together. And that is why it causes me to say, what is the use if you study all about geology and you have your degree in zoology and you know all about astronomy, but in geology you don't know the rock of ages. In astronomy you don't know that Jesus is a bright and morning star. In zoology, you don't know that he is the Lamb of God or the Lion of the tribe of Judah. When it comes to botany, you don't know that he is the Lily of the Valley or the Rose of Sharon. When it comes to history, you don't know that he is the Ancient of Days. When it comes to jewelry, you don't recognize that he is the Pearl of Greatest Price. This is Jesus, wiser, greater than Solomon. Not only greater than Solomon, I say, in the sense of his wisdom, in that he answered, but the Bible tells us that when the Queen of Sheba came to see Solomon, she said that she was impressed not only with the wisdom, but also the house that he built, that is, the work that he did. It was an amazing house. The Bible tells us that for Solomon, in the work that he did, he built that temple, and he built a palace for himself. As a matter of fact, if you read about it, you will find that it took seven years to build a temple. They brought the cedars from Lebanon. They brought the gold from different parts of the world. They, they, they took seven years with 183,000 men to build it. Think of that, 183,000 men employed in the building of the temple. I remember when I was in Banbridge, we had a few builders in the church, and I said to them, as I preached on Solomon one day, I said, uh, how would you like to have 183,000 men working for you? The fellow said to me, well, it'd be all right, but I wouldn't like to have to pay them on Friday night. Eh, it would sort of leave you broke. Well, 183,000 men worked on the grandeur of the temple, and it was a magnificent place. But may I just remind you, Jesus, he is building temples that now are made with hands. Do you know what he does? He makes up my heart his temple. He can make your heart his temple. You see, Solomon made a temple for the people, but Jesus makes the people into temples. The Bible tells us that Christians are as lively stones fitly joined together for a habitation of God by his Holy Spirit. Right into the Corinthians, the Apostle Paul wrote these words, Know you not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost? You have been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body, says the Scriptures. 
The Bible tells me, my friend, that God dwelt in the midst of the temple. The temple was a beautiful, magnificent building, gold and silver and ivory and all the, the, the wood from Lebanon. It was magnificent. But the glory of the temple was not in the gold. It was in the glory of the presence of the Lord. My friend, may I just remind you, God can take sinners such as we are, broken and wrecked sinners. In and of ourselves, we are nothing. But I'll tell you this, he who built the world, thank God today he can put broken hearts together again. He can come and abide within a human heart. I guess you've all known the old uh, poem that we learned at school, it's the first year in school, Humpty Dumpty sat on the wall. Humpty Dumpty had a great fall. All the king's horses and all the king's men couldn't put Humpty together again. Uh, that poem was written by the American pilgrims uh, when they were teaching their children about the book of Genesis. It is the story of Adam and Eve. Adam and Eve had a great fall. All the king's horses, all the king's men, they couldn't put Humpty together again. My friend, may I just remind you, our society can't put society back together again. We can't put it right. I remember when we lived in Labria, Fred Orr had a visit from the, the Minister of Labor for the whole of the, the nation, the great nation of Brazil. And while he was there, he was speaking of the increase of violence, which was bad in his time and is absolutely out of control today. And he said that here in Brazil, we are trying to reform society. We're bringing in new legislation. And by legislation, we hope that we are able to fix the ills of the nation. Fred called a, a fellow in whose name was Carrie Ree. He said to Carrie Ree, uh, Carrie Ree, tell this gentleman what your life was like. Oh, said Carrie Ree, before I became a Christian, I was a derelict. I lived in the forest, but when I came to town with a bit of money to buy goods for my little family, I drank it all. I lay stupefied in the street. People trumped over me. I was a down and out. That's what sin did for me. But one day I met Jesus Christ, and Christ changed me on the inside. And now today, I'm a deacon in the church. I'm serving God. Fred turned to the minister and said, You see, sir, it is not legislation on the outside that's going to better society. It's transformation on the inside that will better society. God has not set us into the world to rectify civilization. But thank God the wrecks of civilization, our Lord Jesus Christ is able to take and transform them and make them anew. And the Bible says, if any man be in Christ, He's a brand new creature. Listen, Solomon's wisdom was great, but Jesus is greater. He's a wonderful counselor. Solomon's work was great, but Jesus in his work is greater. Solomon made temple for the people, but Jesus takes people and makes them his temple to dwell in. Solomon says the Bible that the Queen of Sheba, she was impressed not only with the work, but at those who sat at his table and the riches of the house in which he dwelt. She was overcome. She said, I, I'd heard it all, but when I came to see it, why the half has not been told me. My friend, may I say that that is true of Jesus? You see, when it came to wealth, Solomon was undoubtedly the richest person who ever lived. You can put together King Tut and Bill Gates and Donald Trump and all of their millions and when you put them all together, they wouldn't stand alongside King Solomon. He was the richest, wealthiest king who ever lived. And yet, while he, while he accumulated gold, the Bible tells us that the gold of every mine belongs to him. He made it all. He is the owner of the cattle on a thousand hills. My friend, did, did you ever think that in this world we own nothing? The land we occupy today, others occupied it before us. Other people will occupy it when we're gone. We're not the owners. He owns it all. 
The world was made by him, and the Bible says, without him was not anything made that was made. This is our blessed Lord Jesus. And when you take, my friend, that the cattle on a thousand hills are his, the rubies of every mind, the, the gold that is in every hill, it belongs to Jesus. Why? The Bible tells us that these are not the riches. The riches that we have in Christ, according to the book of Ephesians, it says that he is rich in mercy. He is rich in grace. As a matter of fact, he speaks of the gospel which we preach as the unsearchable riches of Jesus Christ. You can take a calculator and calculate the wealth of Solomon, but the wealth of Jesus is beyond calculation. It is the unsearchable riches of our blessed Savior. Richer, I say, in his wisdom, his work, his wealth. The Bible tells us that she, the queen of Sheba, was overcome when she saw the going up, the ascent by which he went unto the house of the Lord. And when she saw it, there was no more spirit in her. It's not amazing. She was oh, so overcome with Solomon going up to the temple. And well, she might have been. Over there in 1 Kings chapter 8, it tells us all about it. He said that on that day that he dedicated this temple, why he sacrificed on that day 22,000 oxen. Think of that. They had to multiply altars throughout Jerusalem. As they slew those animals, my friend, the blood was flowing like rivers. But they put them on the altar. They not only put them, but the fire consumed them. And all over Jerusalem, there was the aroma of roasting flesh as 22,000 oxen were offered on the altar that day. Added to that, that was not the all. end. 100,000 sheep driving down here in this beautiful evening. I see the sheep on all of the hills. But my friend, I think that all the sheep that we have in this area would not number to 100,000. But that's the sheep that Solomon brought together with 22,000 uh, oxen. Uh, sorry, it wasn't 100,000. It was 120,000. The 20,000 are important. The 120,000. On that day, he offered on the altars of Jerusalem 142,000 animals. Is it any wonder she was overcome? There had never been a sacrifice like this. There had never been an ascent to the house of the Lord like this. But you know something what happened? Though Solomon made that great sacrifice, he had to come back again on another day and make another sacrifice and another sacrifice and another sacrifice. Why? Because all the blood of bulls and goats and Jewish altar slain could never give the conscience peace or wash away the stain. But Christ, I remind you, my friend, that he made a sacrifice. It wasn't the sacrifice of 142,000 animals, but the Bible says that he offered himself upon the cross of Calvary. He was the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me at the place called Calvary. And the Bible tells me, as we reminded ourselves this morning, our blessed Lord Jesus, who gave his back to the smiter and his face to those who plucked off the hair. Our blessed Lord, who was scorned and crowned with thorns, as they spat upon him and, and, and mocked him, they carried him out to the place called Calvary. And there they put out that wooden cross. And on it, our blessed Lord, they stripped him of his raiment. And they begin to spike him. And you can hear the thud of the spikes as they penetrate and pierce the hands of our blessed Lord. But as a lamb is led to the slaughter, he opened not his mouth. My friend, oftentimes, perhaps the, the thieves around him were, were cursing and blaspheming, but our blessed Lord is going to the cross for us. This is how much he loved us. And as they lifted him up on that cross, my friend, in the blazing sun of the Middle East, this is God's altar. He is like the lamb upon an altar slain for us. This is the sacrifice that Jesus made. The Bible tells us that he hung on that cross for three hours. Then at noon, the sun was darkened. And for three hours in the darkness, our blessed Lord is there. But after three hours, he cries these words, It is finished! Finished! 
And at that moment, the Bible tells us a miraculous thing happened. The veil of the temple, which was 60 feet high, higher than the ceiling. The veil of the the temple, 60 feet high, was torn in two from the top to the bottom. If it had said it was torn in two from the bottom to the top, you would tend to think that men could have done it. But it was the invisible hand of Almighty God in heaven, satisfied with the sacrifice of Calvary, that smote the curtain. The curtain opened. Thank God Jesus opened for us a way back to God from the dark paths of sin. My friend, tonight through Christ, the Bible tells us that there is forgiveness and redemption. There's a way to God this evening. Why? Because Jesus offered himself once for all for us. That's why we sing, Jesus bed it all. All to him we owe. Sin had left the crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. Oh, my friend, this evening, if you're not a Christian, can I say that Jesus is greater in his wisdom, in his wealth, in his work. But above all else, he is greater in the great work of salvation that he's wrought for us. Why? Because in his shed blood, Through the work of the cross of Calvary, there's forgiveness for you. There's forgiveness for you. Just as I am and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot, O Lamb of God, I come. Would you not come to Christ tonight? Would you not receive him as your personal Savior? For Jesus Christ gives to us so great salvation. Oh, it is true to say this evening, our blessed Lord, we can look at him and say, he hath done great things for us. He's loved us with so great a love. He made such a great sacrifice. He has prepared for us great things in heaven. My friend, to you tonight, there's offered great salvation if it will only come to this wonderful Savior. Let us pray. Our Heavenly Father, tonight, how we thank you that we're saved. We thank you for the day that you helped us to come, a poor wreck of humanity, and yet come to Christ. And we thank you that you cleansed us and made us anew and gave to us a brand new life and a brand new future. And our Lord, we're asking that what you did for us, you'll do for others too. So bless thy word to every heart, we pray. For these things we ask in our Savior's name and for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen and amen.